forward. When science and civilization in China was first conceived, we thought of it as a single slim volume. When in 1948 I sat down with my first chief collaborator, Wang Leng, Wang Qingning, to work out the general scope of the book, we made a rapid survey of the spectrum of the sciences and decided that the work should have seven volumes. What could not be predicted was the relative vastness of the material which we would find as we went on in the various sections. The later volumes had therefore to appear in parts, each of which was a physical volume in itself. Such is the situation in which we were compelled to acquiesce as the work went on, and here great praise is due to Cambridge University Press, which has never grudged space to the revelation of the wonderful achievements of ancient Chinese science, technology, agriculture and medicine. It will certainly not have escaped the perspicacity of our readers that, as time has gone by, the whole work has become more and more of a cooperative enterprise. About 1970, Lu Guizhen and I took a weighty decision. We could have gone on pegging away single-handed, as it were, in which case the series would never have come within sight of completion in our lifetime. Or we could take to ourselves suitable collaborators and entrust them with sections, subsections or even whole volumes. We decided on the latter course, and in due time this policy bore wonderful fruit. Francesca Bray led off with her History of Agriculture, Volume 6, Part 2, in 1984. Then came Chen Shun with that of Paper and Printing, Volume 5, Part 1 in 1985, and more recently in 1988, Dieter Kuhn has produced the first volume on the history of textile technology, spinning and reeling of textile fibres, volume 5, part 9. Note, since this was written, the following volumes have also been published. Volume 5, part 6, Military Technology, Missiles and Sieges, by Robin Yales, 1994. Volume 6, part 3, Agro-Industries and Forestry by Joseph Needham, 1996. Volume 7, Part 1, Language and Logic by Christoph Habsmeyer, 1998. Volume 5, Part 13, Mining by Peter Golas, 1999. Volume 6, Part 5, Fermentations and Food Science by H. T. Huang, 2000. Volume 6, Part 6, Medicine by Joseph Needham, 2000. End of note. More and more teamwork has thus been put in. Chinese and Westerners have alike contributed. More and more have specialist friends come to be relied upon. We now have about 30 collaborators scattered all over the world. And this is only natural and reasonable, for, as I have often said, no one individual could summon up all the skills necessary for placing the whole development of all the sciences in their correct historical perspective, both in China and the rest of the world. It might be true to say that my own role has risen from that of a single historian of science to the conductor of a kind of orchestra. I can only hope that the resulting music will be found both delightful and fitting. Volume 7 has for its theme the social and economic background of Chinese science and technology, considered always for its relevance to the grand question which has partly inspired the whole work, why modern science originated in Europe alone. The social and economic factors considered in Volume 7 differ from the subject matter of the preceding Volumes 3 to 6 in the way that they must be treated. Volumes 3 to 6 were all concerned with the various sciences and technologies. Sciences and technologies could be described. Social and economic factors must be interpreted. As we pass from the history of science proper to its social and economic background, the discussion necessarily becomes more complex than ever. I realise very well that there must be differences of opinion, particularly as time does not stand still. I am content to put before the reader my views as they remain today. 
Volume 7, Part 1, which has been written by Christoph Habsmeyer, is entirely concerned with language and logical thought, certainly one of the factors most powerfully influencing the development of scientific thinking. Literary Language as a Language for Science by Kenneth Robinson. Note, see also Comparative Criticism 13, Literature and Science. Editor E.S. Schaffer, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge, 1991, pages 3 to 30, to which I added my two pennyworth, had at one time been planned as the sequel to it, and was closely integrated with it, but is now in abbreviated form included in this volume. The close relationship between mathematics, science, logic and language hardly needs to be stressed, but it then became necessary for reasons of size to present it as part of the present volume. It is preceded by three articles written by me some considerable time ago, revised in recent years, and also by The Nature of Chinese Society, a Technical Interpretation, written by my old friend Huang Zhenyu, Ray Huang. His modesty led him to attribute to me far more authorship than I can reasonably claim, and I have therefore insisted that his name should be given pride of place. We are, however, most concerned in Volume 7 with the great question of why modern science did not arise in China after so many centuries of technical leadership, and, closely connected with this, why it was that modern capitalism did not develop in China. I had hoped at one time to cover a wide array of social factors which might have thrown light on this question, but there are limits to what one man can achieve. Let me now, therefore, confine myself to what I believe to be the most important, the collapse of feudalism in Europe and the rise of the bourgeoisie. This requires us first to consider the nature of feudalism. I first began to use the term bureaucratic feudalism in 1943 or thereabouts, when I was in China during the Second World War. I never felt irrevocably bound to the concept, but simply found it a useful description. Others declined to make use of the term or the concept, perhaps preferring just bureaucratism. But this is an example of the differences of opinion which have to be expected in these fields. Of course, in those days, feudal was a pejorative word applied to all the social and economic features of imperial China. Yet the term has always had meaning and significance for me. It stood over against the military aristocratic feudalism of Europe, that system where the king was always at the apex of a pyramid of nobles of different grades, each of whom, by their tenure of fiefdoms, was bound to come to the aid of the king when he wanted to make war, with so many mounted knights, so many archers, so many foot soldiers, etc. This system may have seemed to be stronger, with all those knights in armour clanking about, but was actually weaker, perhaps because less rational. The heir to an earldom might be a moron, but yet by the rule of primogeniture he would have to be the next in succession. A very different situation from that of the Chinese bureaucrat, chosen by imperial examination and equipped with special expertise acquired in the job. In China, individuals in each generation had to justify their promotion by their own efforts. Downward mobility for the heirs and successors of great men could only be counteracted by great effort. Thus, the carrière ouverte au talent had been a Chinese principle for some 2,000 years before it became a French one. Out of this unlikely military aristocratic European milieu, modern natural science could and did arise. When the merchants began to come out of their city-states in the 16th century and capitalism arose, first mercantile and then industrial, modern natural science arose with it in the time of Galileo and Torricelli. This was the rise of the bourgeoisie, and though other factors were involved too, such as the Protestant Reformation, it was this above all which happened in Europe, and in Europe alone. Note, since this was written, Needham came to appreciate the work of Immanuel Wollerstein on The Four Collapses, See Conclusion, page 20. Editor. End of note. The point of view which has been adopted throughout these volumes is that modern science was that form of science 
at which the ancient and medieval sciences of all the countries of the world were aiming. Note, we have adopted the metaphor of the medieval sciences of the different civilizations being like rivers emptying into the great ocean of modern, originally Western, science. This has been regarded in some quarters as a Western imperialist notion. See, however, do the rivers pay court to the sea? The unity of science in East and West. Theoria to Theory 5, 2, 1971. 68 to 77. End of note. But Europe alone was able to get there. Here, the background of Greek logic and Mathesis Universalis was also important. A good deal of work remains to be done on the exact nature of the tie up between modern science and nascent capitalism. I have always pictured it as beginning with the exact specification of materials. If a merchant in the Renaissance period purchased a large quantity of oil from a Greek island, he would need to know not only what its normal use was, but what it could also conceivably be used for. He would want to know its surface tension, its specific gravity, its refractive index, indeed all its properties, before he could decide who to sell it to. This would have been in the time of mercantile capitalism. In industrial capitalism, there is less difficulty in imagining how intimately connected with it were science and technology. The accurate description of materials would have generated accuracy everywhere else, even in subjects like astronomy, where there was no possibility of experimentation, and with exactness came the possibility of mathematization. Modern science has been defined elsewhere, Science and Civilization, China, Volume 3, pages 150 and following. End of note. As the mathematization of hypotheses about nature and the testing of them rigorously by persistent experimentation. Experiment was something rather new. The Greeks had done relatively little of it and although the Chinese had been well acquainted with it, their purposes were primarily practical. Only the European Renaissance found out how to test mathematized hypotheses about nature by relentless experimentation, and so to discover the best method of discovery. But I hope that no one will interpret all this as meaning that I think that modern science, which grew up with capitalism, must always remain wedded to it. Events in our own time have shown that the socialist countries, notably Russia and modern China, are perfectly capable of doing successful modern science. Of course, military aristocratic feudalism existed in other parts of the world beside Europe. I remember thinking when in Japan in 1986 how strange it was that modern science had not originated there as well. But then I reflected that the Japanese had not had the tradition of the Greek city-state, which was so important for Europe. Athens gave rise, when the Renaissance came, to Venice and Genoa, to Pisa and Florence, and these in their turn to Rotterdam and Amsterdam, the cities of the Hanseatic League, and finally London. In these cities, protected by their Lord Mayor or Burgomaster and their aldermen, the merchants could shelter from interference by the feudal nobility of the surrounding countryside until the day when they should come forth, and after lending money to kings, princes and nobles, run the whole show. It is worthwhile taking a look at the idea of the town or city in China compared with Europe. In China, the town was simply a node in the administrative network, held for the emperor by the civil governor and, several bureaucratic ranks lower down, by the military commander. It was the centre of the network of outlying villages, the people of which came in to market in the city. Compare with this the well-known picture by Rembrandt of the militia company of Captain Franz Bannenkock, a group of finely dressed citizens gathered with their weapons and immensely proud of the city they were pledged to defend. Cities in Europe were really states within states, ready in the course of time to provide governments as alternatives, however much it might be glossed over in practice, to the medieval feudal-style governments which had preceded them. China may have been the prime example of bureaucratic feudalism, but all the other non-European parts of the world, such as India, the Southeast Asian countries and the whole Arab world, may be said to have participated in it to some extent. 
It was as if all the intermediate feudal lords had been abolished in China, leaving only the emperor himself, ruling all under heaven by the aid of an immense bureaucracy, the like of which was never dreamed of by the feudal sovereigns of Europe. If anyone does not like the expression bureaucratic feudalism, they might like to settle for Nosfimeric bureaucratism. Nosfimeric was a word which I invented during the war years. While on my perpetual travels, I often encountered Bishop Ronald Hall of Hong Kong, visiting one of his outlying Anglican congregations, and one day we had a chance meeting at Anan in Guizhou. Talking about various things at dinner, I happened to mention to him that I needed a non-pejorative word for that squeeze, graft and corruption, which has always been so characteristic of the bureaucracy in China, and which had loomed so large in the eyes of the modern Western businessmen who tried to buy and sell there. Note, Needham, 1969b, pages 37 and following. End of note. Both our trucks were being repaired that night, and his was finished earlier, so he set off first, but not before leaving me a bit of paper on which was written, See Acts 5, 1-11. When I got to the Bible, I found it was the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who had promised a sum of money to the church, but then kept back a portion of it, and accordingly died, blasted by St. Peter. Now the word used in the Greek New Testament for to sequestrate is nosphizein, and since meros means a part, we can form just the adjective required. One can have little idea of how amazing it is for the Westerner trying to understand China to find how deeply the civil service, the mandarinate, the bureaucracy in fact, is embedded in Chinese life. It is even in the folklore. For example, the giving of bureaucratic titles to the dragons, nagas, gods and spirits by conferring civil ranks upon them. Note. A few examples will suffice to illustrate this phenomenon. They are taken from the Chi Yu Chi, Journey to the West, which draws on the resources of folklore and reflects its conventions. Chapters 10 and 11 of this novel depict the watery world of the Dragon King of the Qing River, which is staffed by a Yaksa, Ye Cha, or demon, on patrol, the shrimp and crab ministers, the Samle, Shi or Shad, councillor, the perch subdirector of the minor court, and the carp president of the board of civil office. When the Thang emperor descends to the underworld, he finds a bureaucracy that mirrors his own, complete with judge of the underworld, king of the first chamber, the grand marshal, demon messengers and soldiers, guards of the bridges, the three tribunes for trying and reviewing cases, and King Yama himself. Anthony Yu, Journey to the West, Volume 1, pages 221-2, to 235-45, to University of Chicago Press, Chicago, 1977. End of note. Bureaucratic feeling is everywhere. Even in the war years, when I went to country places in China, I saw the inscription on red paper on the walls, May the heavenly officials grant peace and plenty. We do not have this in the West. We never had such a civil service. On another occasion, in 1944, I was sitting in a Sichuanese tea house with Sir Frank Eggleston, the Australian ambassador. Seeing the common drain running down the middle of the village street, he exclaimed how medieval everything was and said, You could almost expect to see a knight and men-at-arms come riding by. I replied, yes, indeed, but pointed out that it wouldn't have been a knight, but rather a civilian official, and the men-at-arms would have been represented by unarmed servitors, carrying his titles and dignities on placards. It did not mean that the ultimate sanction was not force, as it has been in all human societies, but it was much better concealed by the Chinese bureaucracy. In a word, if Chinese science, technology and medicine is to be understood, it must be related to the characteristics of Chinese civilization. This is the point of Volume 7. Elsewhere, we have explained how the bureaucratic ethos began by powerfully aiding Chinese science, while only in the later stages did it inhibit any move towards modern science. Such, at any rate, 
is our interpretation of the comparative developments in China and Europe. Note, bureaucratic feudalism's initially favourable influence on science can be illustrated by the remarkable examples of organised field research that were undertaken under imperial auspices in the 8th century. These included a meridian survey directed by the Buddhist monk Yi Sheng and the astronomer royal Nang Kung Yue in 724-725 and at about the same time an expedition to the East Indies for the purpose of surveying the constellations of the Southern Hemisphere. See Science and Civilization in China, Volume 3, pages 202 to 203, and 292 and following. Needham, Beer, Ho et al., 1964, and Needham, 1986, page 7. However, bureaucratic feudalism played an inhibiting role later on. Between 1405 and 1433, the eunuch admiral Cheng Ho led a remarkable series of seven maritime expeditions with a fleet of 63 ocean-going junks that explored the South Seas, collecting information on geography and sea routes, and bringing back produce, exotic animals and luxury goods from the Isles and from India, not to mention tribute from states as far west as the Persian Gulf. These expeditions encouraged advances in navigational technology and increased China's knowledge of the outside world. However, the Confucian bureaucracy, which was never in favour of these expeditions, took advantage of a financial crisis and an overstretched budget to call for their termination, arguing that they drained the treasury unnecessarily and that there was nothing China needed or wanted from foreign countries. Their objection was also most likely due in part to the traditional opposition between Confucian bureaucrats and power-hungry eunuchs. At any rate, the expeditions were stopped thus putting an end to the greatest age of maritime exploration in Chinese history. See Science and Civilization in China, Volume 1, pages 143 to 144, and Volume 4, pages 5 to 4 to 5. End of note. This brings up the question of where the cut-off point has been for Chinese traditional science before the advent of modern science from the West in all the preceding volumes. Generally, we have sought to make it in the neighbourhood of 1700, about the time of the ending of the Jesuit mission. But we have often had occasion to go beyond it, and many instances present themselves. For example, the dinner party at which the Kangxi Emperor talked about the antiquity of the knowledge of gunpowder in China in the presence of Scottish physician John Bell of Antimony took place in 1721. Science and Civilization in China, Volume 5, Part 7, page 127. And in Volume 5, Part 3, we recognised that if one was going to talk about the entry of modern inorganic and inorganic chemistry into China, one would have to come down to the closing years of the 19th century. Finally, in Liu and Needham, 1980, pages 118 and following, when discussing the development of acupuncture, it was clear that the cardinal discovery of acupuncture analgesia permitting major surgery to be performed was only made in the 1950s. In writing this forward to the concluding part of Volume 7, I must not anticipate what I have to say in my conclusion. We have produced 16 volumes while have been on the bridge, and I am sure that our ship will arrive safely in port in the fullness of time, with another 13 or 14 volumes in the hold. I am confident that none of these volumes, many of which I have seen in typescript or have discussed with the authors, would cause me to change my views on the growth of science in China, or to come to general conclusions different from those which I have here elaborated. This brings us to the moment for expressions of indebtedness. First, to the many authors who have joined me in the enterprise and whose work has appeared in Science and Civilization in China, and then to those firm friends and scholars of goodwill whose writing could not be included in the published volumes but who nevertheless did not allow disappointment to cloud our friendship. Note. When the foreword was first drafted, I wrote of my incalculable debt to Lu Guizhen, who shortly afterwards became my wife. Together we had conceived of the Science and Civilization in China project more than 50 years before. This was before I set out for China during the Second World War 
and she departed for America for the duration, as we used to say. Her death in 1991 became our incalculable loss. We are most grateful to the following who have read and commented on distinct portions. Martin Bernal, Cornell, Francesca Bray, UCLA, Peter Burke, Cambridge, Timothy Cheek, Colorado College, Paul Connaughton, Cambridge, Helen Dunstan, Bard College, Nathan Sivin, University of Pennsylvania, Chris Wickham, University of Manchester, R. Bean Wong, University of California, Irvine. It is also appropriate here to thank all my earlier collaborators on the Science and Civilization China project, since there was hardly a conversation with any of them over the past decades that did not have some bearing on the question we are dealing with in Volume 7, and express our thanks first to all those authors who have contributed parts or whole volumes to the series, Wang Ling, Kenneth Robinson, Lu Gui Zhen, Tian Tian Xun, Ho Ping Yu, Nathan Sivin, Robin D. S. Yates, Christoph Gavlikovsky, Dieter Kuhn, Huang Xin Chung, Francesca Bray, Christian Daniels, Nicholas Menzies, Christoph Habsmeyer, Janos Kmielewski, Peter J. Golas, Huang Jun Yu. Nor must we omit to mention those who made a contribution to a volume which could not ultimately be included due to the reshaping of the series. Among these must be included Dirk Bodder, Emmanuel Wollestein, Timothy Brook, Gregory Blue, Christopher Cullen, Lawrence Crader, Marion Bastide, G. L. Hicks, S. G. Redding. For the support of our research and writing, we must mention the National Science Foundation, USA, the Mellon and the Luce Foundations, and the National Institute for Research Advancement, Japan. Without their continued support, our work would have been impossible. Most of their help was mediated through our New York Trust, Chairman John Diebold, and this is also deserving of our warmest thanks for obtaining from the Krieger Foundation a grant of $150,000 towards the building of the south wing of our institute. End of note. Nor can I overlook the part played by those who helped so greatly in the production of the volumes. Wang Ling, Lu Guijian, Gregory Blue, for many years my personal assistant, a constant helper and warm friend, Kenneth Robinson, Christopher Cullen and many others, librarians, secretaries, among whom I must place Diana Brody, my private secretary for many years, gardeners, administrators, trustees and above all our friends of Cambridge University Press, whose support has been unremitting since the project began, and whose names are recorded in Note 9. I cannot close this forward without also expressing the most sincere appreciation for all those who made possible the planning, design and construction of the building in which we work, and in particular its architect, Christophe Grille. It will, I trust, be a green island of quietness in the city of Cambridge for many years to come. Joseph Needham, 1995